Okay, so tonight's really super exciting because not only are we starting the modern councils, but there's a requirement for attending class tonight. You absolutely are required to go get some peanut brittle unless you're allergic to peanuts. This is 20 family recipe. My mom and dad brought this, so thanks mom and dad. Um, it is the best peanut brittle in the world. I don't like peanut brittle, brittle. this is the best stuff there is, so you gotta get some. <laughs> yes. Be careful because it is addictive. <laughs> And I will not be upset if you get up in the middle of class to come get seconds, okay? That will not be a problem. Just make sure there's a little bit left by the end of class so I can have some. Alrighty, so why don't we get started? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. St. John of the Cross. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay. Those of you just coming in, we've got peanut brittle courtesy of Bill and Mary 20. 20 family recipe. It's the best peanut brittle in the world. You've got to get some. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So, the Council of Trent. Now, I um, apologize, I had that weekend there that uh, we didn't have class, but um, so originally I scheduled Trent for three classes. I'm gonna try and keep us on schedule to keep it in two. We'll see how that goes. If we have to get pushed back a little bit, that's all right, we've got some, some um, buffer. Um, all right, so just a brief review. We went through, I'm not going to go all the way back to the beginning, but major themes that were leading up, um, kind of culminating throughout the uh, medieval councils, the Holy Roman Empire. The Holy Roman Empire was this project of Western Christianity after the eastern part of the empire was kind of dwindling. Um, and so they tried to really unite, um, but there were constant problems with that, constant political battles between um, secular or, or civil leaders and religious leaders between princes and bishops and whatnot. Um, and um, yeah, so it was, it was just a, a, a challenging thing that um, there was this constant back and forth and that's gonna be one of the ingredients in the chili that we're making today for the um, Protestant Reformation to kind of boil over. Um, this constant strife and stress between um, the church and the state. The Crusades, uh, which began um, with good intentions, but really kind of over time got worse and worse. That caused worse problems between the East and the West. Um, and it also, the cr Crusades are important because the practice of indulgence has really increased through the Crusades because it was seen as a plenary indulgence if you were to participate in the Crusades. And indulgences becomes a really major 
um, hot button issue of the Protestant Reformation. The Great Western Schism, uh, which as we talked about, um, is what brought about the Council of Constance in the year 1415. Um, and that was when we had three popes at the same time. Um, two of them, uh, we had two popes for several decades, each having their own college of cardinals. So you can tell not only is there division within the Holy Roman Empire, but there's a division going on within the church over this time. We like to think of um, medieval Catholicism as being this monolithic united thing, but that's not always the case. It had its own struggles and divisions within Western Christianity. Um, and that council, the Council of Constance, which had put forward the concept of conciliarism, namely, namely that a, an ecumenical council has more authority than the Pope. And then it kind of leaves this, leaves this open-ended question, is this something that is doctrine for all time or merely a discipline for that situation and that situation alone to settle the Great Western Schism? <clears throat> and the Council of Constance also called for reform in head and members. You had these several attempts throughout the medieval councils recognizing that there were problems of corruption and there was need for reform. However, that last medieval council that we studied, Lateran V, kind of ends in this very eerie way where Pope Leo X is like, well, seems like there's really nothing else for us to ever talk about. Everything's good, everybody. See you later. And two years later, we get what happens today. Um, the modern councils that we're going to be studying now, we have three councils left, and it's, um, it's important that I'm going more into depth in them. It's significant not just going in more in depth because they might be more familiar and more pertinent for our own times, Trent, Vatican I and Vatican II, um, but just their, their content. Um, so a, a few different things. First, the modern councils begin, the Council of Trent begins in the era of the Renaissance. And a major aspect of the Renaissance is um, the resurgence of um, popularity of classical Rome and classical Greece, studying their works, um, on discovering their art. For example, in the city of Rome, there was much uncovering as they would, as they're building new buildings and they're digging things up, they discover ancient Roman and Greek art that had a major influence, for example, on uh, Michelangelo. You can see the influence of Mike, that, that it had on Michelangelo if you follow his work, where, for example, the Pieta, which Michelangelo sculpted when he was um, in his early 20s, and Jesus in the Pieta, you know, that's a statue where the Blessed Mother is holding Jesus after the crucifixion. Um, he's very, like, slim and slender. But then when you get to, for example, one of his later works, the Last Judgment in the Sistine Chapel, Jesus looks like a coal miner. I mean, he's huge. Part of that is because of the influence of ancient Greek art. When they're trying to um, portray in sculptures kind of, um, heroic figures or figures to look up to, they would be larger than life. Um, but the Renaissance has an impact on theology as well. Um, a major early Renaissance thinker, Desiderius Erasmus, um, who was very much a precursor to Martin Luther and had influence on him, yet he disagreed with Martin Luther. Erasmus remained Catholic, but um, he what he kind of um, began this this. Um, mission within um, academia to go ad fontes, which means to the sources. So it means what they're sensing is within philosophy and theology, it's been growing and, and it kind of reached a real peak with St. Thomas Aquinas, the height of scholastic medieval theology. And everybody since Thomas has just been kind of interpreting Thomas from the 13th century through the 16th century, if you were doing Saint, if you were doing theology, you were just commentating on St. Thomas Aquinas, which isn't a bad thing to do. But there was a desire to go back to the sources. So whereas for a long time there wasn't real any real interest, in, for example, in the original biblical languages, Greek and Hebrew, there's this flourishing of the study of Hebrew and Greek during this time, and trying to start to read again some of the early church fathers. This ad fontes. Um, theme um, continues to grow and grow and becomes 
really the main theological point of Vatican II, but we'll get there later. Um, not only that, the modern councils um, are different than the medieval councils in that they're very much back to the kind of focus that the early councils had, namely doctrine, theology. Right? Um, whereas the medieval councils were really just kind of concerned with church order, um, there's some theology going on. But to give you an idea of the theological content, so I have here two volumes. These are all of the decrees and documents and canons of all of the ecumenical councils, okay? It's a two-volume series. This is volume one, and it covers Nicaea I, the first council in 324, 325, excuse me, to Lateran V, which ends in 1517. That's 18 councils in this one book. The next three councils we're gonna talk about are in this book. Give you an idea, right? It's extremely theologically dense, the next three councils we're gonna talk about. I can just kind of show you comparison as well. So, there's Trent, okay? Let's take this off. This is Vatican I. Now it got cut off, that's part of the reason it's so short. Although, if you were to compare this to all of the different councils in this first book, this is still a lot, okay? There's a lot of theology in here. But this is Vatican I, Trent, Vatican I, and then Vatican II, right? So Vatican II is the most prolific council. It had the most that was written. Of course, part of that is just we have better record keeping as well. Um, but these are very theologically dense councils. <clears throat> and their topics now, um, so if we think those early councils are about the Trinity and Christology, right? About the relationship of the three persons of the Trinity and the, na the two natures of Christ, human and divine. The medieval councils were focused on Again, mostly church order, church-state relations, reform, a little bit of theology, a little bit on the sacraments. For example, we had Lateran IV and transubstantiation, um, the, you know, the teaching on the Eucharist as it becomes the real presence of Christ. Um, it's other conversations about the sacraments really are just trying to um, correct some of the heresies that were around at that time, um, not a full-scale like explanation of all the sacraments. Um, but the modern councils are really mainly focused on the church, right? especially Vatican II. Um, but the Council of Trent begins to, it, it talks about the, the two main issues that it has to deal with in reaction to the Protestant Reformation is the relationship between scripture and tradition and then faith and works as for, as far as justification goes. But it's gonna talk about all, it's gonna talk about all of the sacraments in a, in a systematic way. Um, and then Vatican I is gonna start talking about the church but gets cut short. And then Vatican II really is summarized. You can, it's, a, it's a council on the church. Um, and there's this little phrase I like to use for these three um, councils. Raising the bastions and raising the bastions. So these three councils are very much, as really every council obviously is gonna be, it's a reaction to something. And what we find with Trent and Vatican I is because of first the Protestant Reformation and all of the division and violence that was the result of that in Western Europe, and then Vatican I, which deals with the Enlightenment and its intellectual attacks on faith itself, we're gonna find that the church really hunkers down and raises up walls. It starts, it, it starts to get very argumentative against the world that it finds itself surrounded by, whereas you know, throughout medieval period, uh, Western society was Christian, was Catholic. And so now, these three councils, the first two, Trent and Vatican I, are really seeing the church as being attacked. And so it's gonna put, put the guards up 
And then Vatican II is about time to put those guards down to go out into the world, right? Raising the bastions and raising the bastions. <clears throat> All right, some issues in the background to the Protestant Reformation. This is really just a list of those things. I'll go through these individually. So corruption, politically and especially ecclesially. Um, you find, and social, economic, this is something that's been on the rise throughout all of this. Um, there's a general mistrust of authority. That's gonna be, be a nice little ingredient into our pot here. And a real desire for change. <clears throat> for example, one thing that you have happening, um, which we'll get into this uh, next week when we talk about the, the teaching on Trent, um, but for example, you get bishops who do a thing called diocese collecting, where they're able to, one bishop will, I don't know exactly how this all happened, but one bishop would become the bishop of multiple dioceses, like when one bishop retires or dies, they don't replace him. The bishop of you know Batavia is able to also become the bishop of Geneva, because uh, he's doing some you know power plays behind the scenes. And what that meant is that bishop was getting more money. But then what that meant for the people was it was it, the, those dioceses would be more would they would be poorly administrated right um, biggest thing the Re reformation wouldn't have happened without the printing press printing press is the most important historical um, seemingly random thing that was um, that, that made the reformation possible so it's invented in 1436 by Johannes Gutenberg. Although um, now we know that there was a printing press um, present in China as early as the ninth century, and it's believed that he might have um, kind of taken some ideas from that. But so it becomes present in Western society in the 15th century. Um, the printing press increases literacy and education because now more and more people can read. It's not gonna cost um, a lifetime of wages to purchase a book. There's an easier communication of ideas. <coughs> That's gonna speed up social change. And just think about, in our own lifetimes, the impact that TV, internet, and social media have on social change, right? And we think now, like, just the world of information that we have access to, um, similar revolution that happened, perhaps even more impactful because he went from zero to 90 and we've gone from 90 to 100, you know? Um, there's a loss of jobs, right? These are just social factors that things are brewing because <clears throat> here we have technology that's replacing human labor. Uh, you have more and more, especially fringe voices, well, we're not familiar with that at all, are we? In the world of social media, now more and more people can have their opinion heard and be established as, as if it's an authority. So more and more people are able to get their ideas spread. And then of course, especially more access to the Bible in print, rather than just simply being at mass and hearing your readings proclaimed. <coughs> Okay, the effect of conciliarism, it's an unsettled question. And as we're probably familiar with, when you have unsettled questions in the history of the church, it doesn't tend to stabilize things, right? People get worried and confused. So it's, there's, an, uh, a lack, there's a lack of stability. If conciliarism is true, this brings doubt upon the authority of the Pope and where he really stands in relationship with the church. And especially that's going to be the case, how much do we need to listen to a pope if he seems really corrupt to us? You know, there's the Borgia popes, the papacy being bought out by the mafia. Well, if they don't have that much authority, what, why would we listen to these popes that are clearly corrupt? <clears throat> um, conciliarism also meant, so you have, before democracy really exists in Europe, you, you have this process beginning. Before, you know, the philosophy reemerged, the classical philosophy of de democracy that then became kind of the main political idea in the modern period, here you just have more and more 
lay engagement in society than before from the regular people. Um, all right, another important aspect, there's a kind of democratization of spirituality in the late medieval period. Um, much of the prayers and devotions that we're familiar with today that we think of instinctively as being a part of um, church tradition and spirituality since the beginning um, is not the case. They're actually, in terms of church history, somewhat modern. Um, so, now the rosary goes back earlier, but the idea that I can have my own kind of quasi-liturgical prayer um, that is seen to be spiritually efficacious and it's a sacramental, um, this is something that really is, flourishes during this time. Of course, there's all sorts of, it's not like individual lay people didn't pray before the rosary. But for example, St. Augustine, he wouldn't have known what the rosary was. Um, there were dip very... I couldn't hear what you said. Siri, you shouldn't be listening. Um, so uh, the rosary and other, other forms of devotional prayer like it really kind of flourished during this time. Um, there is a history, certainly in the Eastern Church, for example, if you've ever heard of the Jesus Prayer, so that, that still would have used a rope with knots in it, like our rosary with beads. Um, but in, in the West, you have development of various forms of popular devotion. The rosary, the scapular, um, veneration of relics becomes super popular, popular in the late medieval period. Not that there wasn't the use of relics in the past, there certainly was, um, but it be, there becomes kind of this, uh, especially because of the Crusades, when you had the Crusaders going back to the Holy Land and in their journeys coming across various relics and bringing them back, there's this big um, resurgence in um, devotion to the relics. Uh, adoration, Eucharistic adoration. Again, St. Augustine wouldn't have um, experienced Eucharistic adoration. In the early church, you would have had um, the Eucharist uh, reposed in the tabernacle in the church, and if you were doing private Eucharistic prayer, you simply would be in the presence of the tabernacle. Adoration um, grows during the late medieval period, um, and in particular, if you think during this time when most people didn't go to communion all that often, right? It would be the exact opposite of what we do today. Um, most people, most of the time, didn't go to communion. Um, they knew that they had to once a year. They would make sure to confess and go to communion once a year. Um, but it was understood that it was still um, efficacious to adore Christ in the Eucharist. So there's stories of at the cells now, you know, the, the mass during this time would have been celebrated when the priest is facing the same direction as the people. So when he lifts up the host, you know, he would lift it high so they could see. There's stories of people being at mass when priests who hadn't lifted it quite high enough for them to, to see, they'd be shouting from the back, lift it higher, right? Because they couldn't adore Christ, which was their way of trying to um, participate in spiritual communion when they weren't going to be receiving communion. So, hence, adoration, the development of, that we can even suspend this moment in Mass when you adore the Eucharistic presence of Jesus. Um, confraternities, which is basically like associations of lay people to try and live some kind of common rule of prayer, so it's not quite a religious order, but it's still a, a joint effort of lay people to grow in holiness. Flourishing of lots of spiritual writings during this time, the most popular of them being um, Thomas A. Kempis' The Imitation of Christ. That was the most popular kind of spiritual reading at the time after, after the Bible. Um, as well as a continued growth in the practice of indulgences. <clears throat> um, so the, the point of all of this is that Lay people are more and more finding their own ways, um, of course, with the church to engage in their faith and grow in holiness, right? Um, it's more, I guess, there's a sense of a democratization and a more active spirituality than passive of, of simply what's being received in the liturgy and the sacraments. Oops. Does 
This is a passage from the imitation of Christ in the, in, in the introduction. What good does it do to speak learnedly about the Trinity if lacking humility you displease the Trinity? I would rather feel contrition than know how to define it. For what would it profit us to know the whole Bible by heart and the principles of all the philosophers if we live without grace and the love of God? What he's getting at here is um, theology and spirituality have become highly um, academicized, <laughs> and become highly academic in the medieval period because of the growth of the universities. And so here you have this response, this reaction um, that Thomas Akempis is really putting his finger on of like, yeah, 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 all that highfalutin theology stuff, but I need to grow in holiness myself regardless of what I'm getting from study or from the church. The doctrine of purgatory. If you remember in the Council of Florence that we, in our last class that we had discussed, the East and the West had met or had had agreed upon a certain teaching on purgatory, namely that there is a cleansing after death, and there's really not much more that they say other than that, because there's a recognition that, you know, the East has a little bit of a problem thinking of purgatory as a place, but they recognize we still need to be purified after death. Um, <clears throat> but during this time, right, so it, the reason why we believe in um, purgatory, I mean, we can talk, and that's not what this class is about, but there's the scriptural basis, but then most especially you find instinctively from the beginning, Christians pray for the dead. Lex orandi, lex credendi means the law of prayer is the law of belief. If you want to know what Christians believe, look at how they pray. From the beginning, we prayed for the dead. Well, why would you pray for the dead if they're in heaven? And what good would prayers for them do if they're in hell? So therefore, there must be this um, reality where Christians need prayer after death. Um, there's the development of the sacrament of penance. So if you remember way back, Council of Nicaea 1, where we first started learning about some of those really big penances that you would get if you had apostatized and returned to the church, where you would, could be stuck doing penance for like 12 or 13 years. The idea was, well, if you didn't finish your penance during life, then purgatory would be a time that you, that, that penance would be completed. <clears throat> um, Council of Florence, we, you know, there's that agreement on purification needed after death. However, with indulgences, which is kind of like another form of the penance that you do after confession, right? It's, what are you doing when you do penance after confession? You're making a met. You've been forgiven, but you're making amends. The um, and indulgences are just like that. So um, you're making amends for the effects due to sin. So, for example, the explanation or the analogy I give to kids is. If you're playing baseball in the backyard and you, and you hit a home run and it smashes through your neighbor's window and you go over and apologize and the neighbor forgives you, great. But then he may say, but you know what to pay to make up for and to pay for the window you broke? You're gonna mow my lawn for the next two weeks, right? That's the, that's the concept of penance and indulgences is that indulgences, indulgences don't, you, don't forgive you of sin. That happens in confession. Indulgences is a way of making up for the effects or the results of sin. Um, and with the rise of indulgences during this time, there's a rise in Western theology in the emphasis on the precise quantification of purgatory, where we think, okay, if you, if you missed mass, then that's going to be 200 years in purgatory. But if you do this indulgence, then you'll be able to cut off half of that, right? That is something that's that's never been some like f a full official doctrine of the church that's part of the spirituality that develops during this time then there's this guy johan tetzel he's a german dominican and he goes on a campaign throughout europe um, to sell indulgences in particular for the building of the new saint peter's basilica so he would say um, when he would deliver these indulgences when they were bought, and then he, there was a sacramental rite that he would do to, to give the indulgence to individuals, he'd say, I replace you in the state of innocence and purity in which you were at the hour of baptism. 
So there's this, it's playing on people's fears a little bit, right? There's people who are very afraid of how or the time that they're gonna have to spend in purgatory, wondering if they've done enough penances or have received enough indulgence to minimize that time. Here's this guy selling indulgences that says when you receive them, it's like the holiness and purity that you were at the moment of your baptism. So this is what the selling of baptisms produced for us. I love St. Peter's, it's my favorite church in the world. It's amazing, it's beautiful. Um, but so St. Peter's Basilica, this is not the first version. The first version was built in 324 after the Edict of Milan when Constantine made Christianity legal and then he went to Pope Sylvester at the time and he said, what else would you like me to do? And he said, let's build some churches. And so Constantine first focused on building St. Peter, not this one, but building St. Peter's Basilica over the site of what he believed at the time to be Peter's grave. Um, flash forward, it turns out he was true, uh, like 1700 years later. Um, but uh, in the 15th century, in the late 15th century, that first basilica, a thousand years uh, after it had been around for a thousand years, is looking pretty decrepit. And so if you remember last class, I talked about Pope Julius II. He tears it down and begins building the new St. Peter's Basilica. It, they begin in 1508. That's when the first stone is laid for the new basilica. Okay, so that's eight years or nine years before the beginning of the Protestant Reformation. It's not complete until like 1636, I think it is. Now think, what else is going on during this time in the 16th century is the discovery of the New World. When you go inside St. Peter's Basilica, many you'll see gold all over the ceiling. The gold comes from the New World. Um, obviously, that was a that cost a pretty penny to build that thing, and it and it was over the course of something like 12 popes and eight different artists that had worked on it. Um, it cost a lot. And the selling of indulgences was one of the ways that it was being paid for in its initial stages. <clears throat> okay, Martin Luther. Now, because we don't have all the time in the world, we're, we're just gonna focus on Martin Luther. We could talk about John Calvin, we could talk about Zwingli, um, and those are all important. And Protestantism is certainly different today in many ways than what it would have been just when Martin Luther started um, with his 95 theses. But he really is the most important figure that gets the Protestant Reformation going. He leads the charge, and then other, and shortly after, John, John Calvin starts to follow suit, um, and Zwingli and others. So Martin Luther, he was born in 1483 and died in 14, excuse me, 1546. The Council of Trent begins in the year 1545. So he dies a year after the, the Council of Trent begins. He was invited, but did not come. Um, he was an Augustinian monk. Now, um, think back, what theology of St. Augustine have we talked about in this class before? Way back when we were talking about um, the Council of Ephesus, one of the arguments in the background, like a side issue, the main issue was on the, the relationship of the natures of Christ, but there was a side issue, this argument between Augustine and Pelagius. Pelagius was the guy who said, grace is simply following the teachings of Jesus, that all of us um, have the capability to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps and save ourselves as long as we follow the teachings of Jesus. In response to that, St. Augustine was known as the doctor of grace, the teacher of grace. So Augustine is very much concerned with never going down that path of thinking that we can earn our salvation and always expressing the fact that our salvation is like 99.9999999% God's grace. We have to cooperate, we have to work with it, we have to accept it, but it's like all God's grace that saves us. Um, so Martin Luther is in this school of thought. He's a scripture scholar, and um, 
he finds himself very annoyed with many priests that are not very that weren't educated very well and don't know scripture um, he deeply struggled with sin and scrupulosity Martin Luther when he was in the monastery was constantly anxious about his sinfulness and how he would fall again and again into sin and he was extreme and he struggled a lot with scrupulosity of thinking everything that he did was a sin um, so that's a little bit what's in the background but um, it's in on Halloween on October 31st in the year 1517 so this is like six months after the close of Lateran 5 um, that he there's the famous scene of him nailing his 95 theses um, to the door on the cathedral in Wittenberg I was about to say Wittgenstein but that's a philosopher um, so his main points in, in what he began now his theology really evolved over time and at first he was really just going after what he thought were some abuses like the selling of indulgences but then at first he kind of gets ignored then there's a local council that they start to try and deal with his stuff um, there's thought about if you notice he starts this argument in 1517, and it's 30, 28 years later that the Council of Trent is called. So 28 year period where this has just exploded throughout Europe, again, because of the printing press. Um, so, but, so Martin Luther really doesn't have any, any, any desire to break off from the church at this point. That happens much later. Um, but his points of theology are sola scriptura, scripture alone. That if we want to understand the truths of the faith, we don't look to popes or councils or anything, the scripture. Um, total depravity, now I put an asterisk there because that's not Martin Luther's um, uh, phrase, that's a phrase of Calvin, John Calvin. Calvin really just saw himself as taking Martin Luther Martin Luther's theology to its logical conclusion, um, but basically what we'll, I'll get here in a minute to what um, total depravity is about. Uh, sola fide, we're saved by faith alone. His teaching on the sacraments, his teaching on the church, as well as purgatory and indulgences. So let's go through each of these. Sola Scriptura. For Martin Luther, he has several different, we've got some bullet points here of his concept of what scripture, of his teaching on scripture. He would say that the Bible is the word of God. Okay, yeah, we, we agree with that. It's inspired. It's infallible. It's authoritative. And here's where it starts to get, where he starts to get a little bit different. He would say that scripture is clear. Now, what I, where I say it's different, I don't mean to say that scripture is unclear, but what he meant by that is it's simple. He meant, you know, we spend so much time interpreting and, and you know, really diving into it and theologizing about scripture. He said, just pick up the book and read it and you'll know what it says. I don't know if you've read the Bible, but that hasn't been my experience. Um, it's sufficient, okay? So it's a, it's sufficient for all Christian doctrine, and that it's efficient. So he views the Bible kind of like a sacrament. If I read it in the Holy Spirit, it will give me, it, you know, it will bring an increase of grace of the sacraments. <coughs> Therefore. It's above all church authority, popes and bishops and priests and councils. I just said that. Above all tradition. I don't know why that just happened. What's going on here? There's a stuck button. Let's do this the quicker way. It's above all 
traditions of our indulgences, devotion, and purgatory. Now, one thing I should point out is Martin Luther maintained throughout his life a deep devotion to Mary. He also continued to go to confession. While he didn't see confession as a sacrament per se, he still viewed it as a practice within the church. So that's some things where, you know, it's like Protestant theology isn't the same as it was for Martin Luther. Um, and, and here's a, a real important point. For Martin Luther, you, you want to ask the question, well, why do you believe, Martin Luther, that it's the word of God? Why do you believe it's infallible? Why do you believe that, that it's inspired? The Catholic reasons for this are much more complex, and there's a lot, there's a lot of interlaying things that come toward um, defending this. For Martin Luther, it's read it and you'll know. The Holy Spirit will convict you subjectively of its truth. So this is certainly within, um, I'm no expert in Protestant theology, but just say culturally speaking, um, you, have, you get into a, a debate or a discussion with a Protestant, their instinct is, where is that in the Bible? And if you get to the question of, okay, why do you, why do you see the Bible as authoritative? Odds are they're going to say, well, you don't. Why don't you think it? And we would say, I do. But that's because we see it as nestled within the body of Christ, the church, because Christ gave his authority to his apostles to go, therefore, and preach and then to write these things down. For Martin, Luther, Martin Luther's theology, I would call it circular, but it's true because you know it's true, and you know it's true because it's true. It's You just simply, by reading it, and if you're open to, to the Holy Spirit, open to the conversion that comes from faith, the Holy Spirit will convict you of its own authority and infallibility. <clears throat> Therefore, the, the individual Christian, right, me and my Bible, the individual Christian should trust the clear reading of Scripture above any tradition, no matter how long and universally it has been believed. Okay, you can see how this is going to lead to, for example, a stripping away of the doctrine of purgatory. Sure, Christians have been um, praying for the dead for 1,500 years, but I don't see the word purgatory in the Bible. Ergo, it doesn't exist. Okay? <clears throat> um, and one thing... So, uh, well, this is a quote from um, 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 through 17, very important for Martin Luther and his theology. All scripture is God-breathed, that's another translation of inspired, and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. And so we say, look, scripture itself is saying that it's sufficient. Um... Um, all right, total depravity. So the idea is after the fall, Adam and Eve have they are they're now they're now totally depraved of God's grace. Right? God says to Adam, You are dust, and you to dust you shall return. Philippians, excuse me, Psalm 53, and this is quoted. In Romans 3, another favorite passage of Martin Luther, God looks down from heaven upon the human race to see if even one is wise, if even one seeks God. All have gone astray, all alike are perverse. Not one does what is, what is right, not even one. So um, we believe this too. All of humanity has fallen. But for Martin Luther, um, oh, okay. Sorry, I'm missing a, I think I'm missing a slide with the next bullet on there. But the point is, for Martin Luther, and especially for John Calvin, the extension of his theology is um, that after the fall, human nature is destroyed because it was created by God and we rejected God. So now our human nature, as it was created by God, is not really truly even human nature itself. Human nature is destroyed. It's it's purely belonging to sin now. Um, 
the other, um, some of these other teachings of Martin Luther are um, the result of that idea. So, sola fide, it means that we're saved by faith alone. Because, oh, I put it in here, okay. because human nature is destroyed, we cannot save ourselves. Remember from our very first class, we're saved by the grace of the Lord Jesus. He would say, looking at this passage, we're saved by grace, we're saved by grace alone. Um, very often in Martin Luther's translations of scripture, he would just, every now and then, just add that word into various passages because it was his teaching, right? Oh, we're saved by grace. That means we're only saved by grace. It's by grace alone. <coughs> we have access to this grace through faith alone. Only by believing that we are saved by his grace can we receive his grace. As St. Paul says in Romans, therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Very often if it's a, if, if a Catholic for the first time is hearing of um, Protestant theology on faith and works, then they're going to say, look, look at Romans. It says there, we're saved by faith alone, not by the works of the law. It can really catch you off guard. We're going to get into the theology of Trent to try and explain that. I can also give a little bit more about the actual, <coughs> um, uh, what really St. Paul is saying there in Romans is not what Martin Luther means. So for Martin Luther, the Catholic Church has become Pelagian because it promotes salvation by works. Live the Christian life, you know, um, attend mass as many as you can, pray the rosary, receive indulgences. These are all pulling yourself up by your bootstraps and trying to save yourself. He says this is anti-scriptural. With regard to the sacraments, he's going to say that we could only accept sacraments that are clearly instituted by Christ in Scripture. So, like I said, he went to confession, um, and certainly in Protestant churches and in, in Luther's churches that he set up, there would be marriage, but they didn't see it as a sacrament. They don't see it as a sacrament. Um, he, for Martin Luther, he only sees um, baptism and Eucharist as being clearly instituted by Christ. Um, now, it's important to note that, for example, like the sacrament of anointing, every time I do the sacrament of, of anointing, I'm quoting, excuse me, James chapter 5, where he says, Are there people sick among you? Send for the priests of the church, and they will anoint them with oil and lay hands on them. It's literally the sacrament of anointing right there in the, in the first century church. Well, Martin Luther wasn't a big fan of the letter of James, so he took it out of his Bible. But, um, and, but other people would say, well, that wasn't clearly instituted by Christ. That was something that happened after, and only something that's clearly instituted by Christ can properly be called a sacrament. We're going to get all into the teaching of Trent, how they respond to all of this. Um, <laughs> Baptism and Holy Communion. Um, Hebrews 10, uh, chapter 10, verse 8, uh, refers to how Jesus died on the cross once for all. Therefore, no sacrifices are, need to be made again. Now, the letter, uh, the author of the letter to the Hebrews is talking about how the sacrifice of Christ has fulfilled the sacraments of the old law. Therefore, we don't need to now offer other sacrifices in the temple, sacrifice of other animals and wheat offerings and all of that, because it's been fulfilled in the one sacrifice of Christ for all. Luther and other Protestant reformers would, would say, but therefore, the Mass can't be a sacrifice. Otherwise, that would mean that the death of Christ was insufficient, and so therefore, this, the Holy Communion, the Mass, and he would have called it, still called it the Mass in the beginning, um, is a communal meal of remembrance, taking the line from St. Paul, whenever you drink, eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the death of the Lord. 
Um, because of that symbolic meaning, the precise, so there's this shift on focus on the symbol. Now, Martin Luther believed that Christ was truly present in the Eucharist, but in a different way. But because it's not sacrifice, and there's this focus on the symbolic element of the, like reliving the Last Supper, then therefore the precise elements uh, or both forms should be received by all. So one of the reasons why the church, even today, rarely has everybody receiving under both species, um, the host and, and the precious blood, was in response to this, to, to nail down the point that regardless of what you receive in the Eucharist, you're receiving entirely Christ. He, Martin Luther would say, if you weren't receiving both, you weren't fully receiving communion. And then he also um, teaches, so again, adoration is a natural consequence to the clarifying of the doctrine of transubstantiation. Because if it's no longer bread, but only the presence of Christ, there's no problem worshiping it in that way. Martin Luther would say, it is the presence of Christ, but it remains bread. It's like, so he says consubstantiation. We think of Jesus as consubstantial with the Father, right? They're of one being. Jesus, or Martin Luther would say, Jesus and the bread are there together. Because the main purpose of communion, and he's right about this, is to consume it. Jesus didn't say, take this, all of you, and put it in a monstrance and adore it. He said, take this, all of you, and eat of it. I'm not knocking adoration. I love adoration. I'm just saying the primary purpose of the Eucharist is for us to consume it. And then adoration is a further um, deepening of our prayer life of that beautiful reality. But Martin Luther would say, well, you can't do that because it is still, it's also still bread. With regard to the church, <clears throat> for the Protestant reformers, the church is not a visible hierarchical institution. It's an in invisible or spiritual communion of believers. In 1 Peter, speaking to all Christians, he says, all of you, you are a royal priesthood. We believe this too, that each and every one in this room here, if you're baptized, you are a priest of Jesus Christ, just a different kind than I am, but that you offer spiritual sacrifice acceptable to the Father in your prayer and in your participation in the Mass. But um, a lot of the, the commentary that I'm adding is really from the further reflection of the church in trying to explain these things in the aftermath. Um, um, there's no, he would say, you don't see Christ clearly instituting the priesthood, the sacrament of holy orders in, in the Gospels. Therefore, there's no sacramental priesthood, purely the priesthood of all the baptized. <clears throat> Ministers um, become just simply chosen from the community, people that they want them, want to lead them, bishops. Uh, it, there's no longer a sense of apostolic succession um, that, you know, it's, that it's this thing that's been late, you know, handed down generation after generation because, again, there's no sacrament of holy orders. And then, um, eventually, because of his frustration with the popes who either were ignoring him or giving him a hard time, he begins to, to speak about the papacy itself as the Antichrist because it claims to have the authority of Christ on earth. <clears throat> um, we've already kind of touched on this, but okay, I don't see purgatory in the Bible, and we're saved by grace through faith, so what else is there need for? If we need purgatory, then we don't need Christ. And this would still be the standard argument given today. Um, against the Catholic teaching on purgatory. Only heaven for believers and hell for non-believers. The only thing that marks salvation is belief. Indulgences. This is an image or a painting of Johann Tetzel selling indulgences in the, kind of in the town square. If we're saved by grace through faith, once forgiven, there's no punishment for sin. Oh yeah, there's this 
people have said that this isn't really true, that Martin Luther didn't say this, or maybe one of his followers did. He said, once we're saved by faith in Christ, we, the idea is that um, it's a substitution salvation. God no longer sees us, but he sees Christ. And so we remain sinful, um, but we're kind of covered in Christ. So there's this line attributed to Martin Luther, whether he said it or not, but it, it, it's sig significant of the, it signifies his theology that we remain a dunghill simply covered in snow. Um, <clears throat> no punishment for sin, so indulgences are completely unnecessary. Um, and he would say indulgences are an extreme example of the Catholic error of salvation through works. So a lot of times you'll hear in um, like popular Christianity, people talk about Jesus died so I don't have to suffer, right? His suffering means that I'm free from that. That's not Catholic theology. Jesus died to save us from hell and to save us from sin, right? Really just to save us from sin so that we wouldn't be separated from God, which is hell. That doesn't mean that that saves us from any suffering, as the gospel passage was this morning. If anyone wants to be my disciple, they must pick up their cross and follow me daily. So Luther, Martin Luther was a very gifted writer and preacher. That's partly why he gained so much popularity. John Calvin was much more of a a systematic theologian so he wrote a lot more and really kind of codified a lot of Protestant thought even though he and Luther didn't always see eye to eye on things but Martin Luther was was used a lot of um, just uh, emotional rhetoric um, so to kind of really um, make the point on some of his ideas human reason is evil the greatest enemy that faith has you see where we are today when people think that faith and reason are opposed. This is the flip side of, this is the opposite result of Martin Luther's thought process here, where today, in the, in, after the Enlightenment, people think, well, if you're gonna believe in science, you can't believe in faith. Well, the, the, the beginnings of that are in Martin Luther. He would say, if you're gonna believe in faith, you can't trust human reason at all. That's another part why he would say, let's not worry about what councils thought or traditions of the church, just read the scriptures and that tells you what to think. Um, he would say, be a sinner and sin boldly, but believe and rejoice in Christ even more boldly. So this is him, him really trying to nail home the point that uh, doesn't matter what we do, all that matters is that we have faith in Christ. And this is a line that I included in here in the past. I found this old slide here because I used to teach to teach councils to eighth graders. You say what comes out of your mouth, mouth must be kept. He's talking about one of the ecclesial officials telling him to keep quiet. I hear, which mouth do you mean? The one from which the farts come? You can keep that to yourself. Eighth graders really got to kick that out. <laughs> All right, last bit here. So the council, and, and there's, I mean, I'm skipping so much of what happened between 1517 and 1455. Um, but the council begins in the year 1455. It begins in Trent, which is in northern Italy, and that at the time was German-speaking Italy. So it was seen as a compromise. Um, Protestantism begins in Germany with Luther. Um, if they would, were to have it in Rome, it would be seen as like, just not a good political move, politically savvy. And part of the reason why, so part of the reason why the Reformation spread so rapidly, certainly because of the printing press, but also with all of these divisions between church and state, and you have all of these political rulers uh, throughout Western Europe who are sick of the Pope trying to tell them what to do. You have this guy, Martin Luther, that all of these people are really loving because he's preaching with fire and he, with zeal, and he, he's, make, he's saying things that seem to make sense to them. He seems to really understand the Bible, and he's saying things like, why would we give money to Rome? 
and then all of the princes in Germany go, oh, what, 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 what'd you just say? We don't have to give money to Rome? I like this Luther guy, right? So, um, so they have it in Trent as kind of a, um, a medium point, uh, a midway point. It's um, German-speaking Italy. The Council of Trent is the long, longest lasting, lasting council, although that's because it has three different sessions that are spread years apart. It begins in 1545, it ends in 1563, so eight, over a period of 18 years. Um, <clears throat> part of that was because of a plague that swept through, part of that was because of the wars that were going on in Europe between Catholics and Protestants, part of that is because uh, this is part of the reason it took so long to get the council up and running as well as to keep it going is this constant question of conciliarism. Popes are worried, what are these bishops going to do if they hold a council after Constance, which said that they have more authority than a pope? Um, the first meeting, when they first arrived, only 24 bishops showed up. Um, they had invited Martin Luther and other Protestant theologians. Martin Luther was not there, but there were some Protestant theologians there. Eventually, it grows to um, 200 and then 400 bishops. But at the beginning, it really struggled to, to get going. So the content is going to be responding to all of these things from Martin Luther. It's going to talk about scripture and tradition, justification by faith and works. It's going to talk about all the sacraments. Um, it's going to talk about purgatory, indulgences. It's going to respond to all of these different things. Um, do, 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 do. And it's known as the Counter-Reformation um, Council. Again, raising the bastions. Right. So rather than a ref reform within the church, now there's this reform go leaving the church and fighting against it. And so now the Catholic Church itself is going to lobby a, a, a counterattack. <clears throat> However, it begins the first document on the manner of living at the council. The whole, this is when they first gathered the first document that they published for all those involved. The Holy Council of Trent has decreed that all of the faithful <coughs> gathered in the city of Trent are to be exhorted that they resolve to free themselves from the evils and sins which they have hitherto committed and for the future to walk in the fear of the Lord, to be urgent in prayer, to confess more often, to receive the Eucharist, visit churches frequently, fulfill the Lord's commands, and also to offer prayers daily for peace among Christian rulers and for the unity of the church. One of the things is that Trent, um, when it's not a whole lot is known about it, it's seen as, because it's a counter-reformation council, it's seen as something that like really takes a hard line against Protestants. It's actually, the beginning of the council recognizes that, how did this happen? This happened because of sin. This division is the result of sin. Um, the sinfulness that has been present in the church has resulted in the fact that not only did this guy Martin Luther, um, you know, start saying these things, but so many people, why did it catch on and they wanted to follow him? And so the, the council looks to itself and the members of the church to say, the number one cure is, is growth in holiness. Um, and it really did produce that because the 16th century and 17th century produced some of the, the church's greatest saints. We think of the Counter-Reformation saints, St. Teresa of Avila, St. John of the Cross, who we celebrate today, St. Ignatius of Loyola, St. Francis de Sales, um, St. Charles Borromeo, and just you know, people of immense holiness. So, it's a nice little image of the Council of Trent, and we can stop there. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We will have a class next week, um, and we will be moving on to the actual documents of the Council of Trent. Be ready for your thinking caps as we really look into the theology of Trent. Uh, we're going to get the highlights, but it's still some can be some thicker stuff. Okay, thanks everybody. Have a great night. Don't forget to get some peanut butter. Yeah,